there's this preconceived notion out there that to be edified, uh, the Bible talks about edification, by the way. It's, it's really a Bible term. Uh, you don't see it. No, nobody walks around saying, hey, I'm edified. You know what I mean? I, I was edified by that. You know, they don't really do that, except the Bible talks about edification a lot. But the thing is, is that people have this idea that for them to be edified, it means that they walk away feeling really good. And then they say, oh, that was edifying. I felt really good. That, that's not what the Bible says, though. And I'm going to prove that tonight. That's, that's not what edification is. Edification isn't making you feel good when you come to church. That's not what it means to be edified. But that's what most people think it means when you come to church, is that you're to come to church to be edified. But the first thing we notice here in, in studying this thing of edification is this. Edification is the purpose for the saints to meet. It's for them to be edified. That's why we come together. That's where we're edified is the local church. That's where you and I are edified is the local New Testament church. Um, the first time we see that word in its form, edification, the Bible says in Acts 9.31, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee, and Galilee, excuse me, and Samaria, and were edified. They were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. It says that, well, something happened that they were edified. Well, what happened? Uh, it says here the disciples took, uh, but their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night, in verse number 24, to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. See, they were all scared of him. They were extremely terrified of him. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto, unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them go, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake. Now listen, listen to what he did, though. They were edified, right? Why? It says, and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified. So they were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord. You see that? Now, why were they walking in the fear of the Lord? Because they were edified. What does that mean, that word edification? Well, let me give you Webster's 1828 dictionary definition, and then we're going we're gonna to actually go through tonight every time edified is used in the Scriptures, okay? Which there's not that many, but we're going to do this. When I do these things with you like this, when I take a word like rebellion and other things, and I do, I'm taking it because I want to show you exactly what the Bible says about that, and I don't want you just to take my definition, but I want you to see what the Scriptures say all the way through every time that word is used. Why? Well, because these are Bible words, that's why. And they need to be defined by the context in which they are given in in the scriptures. All right. But this gives you an idea here. To, it means to build in a literal sense. It's not now used like that, but that's what it means. It also means this. How do I build, though? How does it build you up? To edify you means to build you up. It does. But how do I how how are you to be built up? How is a pastor or the preachers? Not just the pastor, but we're to edify one another, the Bible says. And we do that at the local church. Notice here when it talks about edification, what's the first thing you see in Acts chapter 9? The churches. It says that they were edified in the churches. Why? Because that's where edification takes place, is in the churches. I mean, primarily, that's the reason we come together, is to be edified and to glorify God. But to build you up, that's why you come to church. We're to be built up. And people say, well, I, you know, that, that hard preaching, that tears you down. No, it doesn't. It might tear your sin down. It might tear your flesh down. But it ought to build up your spirit. It ought to edify your spirit. If it doesn't, there's something wrong. There's something wrong if it doesn't edify you. And it's not something wrong with the preaching. It's something wrong with the receiver. That's what it is, because that's because we have again we have this false notion of what edification is. We think it's to make it oh it's just to give us that 
that fuzzy, warm feeling where we feel, oh, it's just so fun to go to church. We sang a bunch of songs and everything was just, everything was perfect. And you know what? The preacher didn't step on my toes and I got to leave and, and, and the sermon didn't do anything to me. And you can go on and live like the devil and keep watching all the wicked movies and listen to the wicked music and, and drinking the wicked booze and, 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 and snorting the wicked coke and living in fornication, doing everything else because that's the way it is today. But that doesn't build your new man up, does it? That type of preaching will not build the new man, will it? No, it won't. Romans chapter 14, verse number 19. We'll touch on this thing of the church and edification uh, in, in a few verses here. But uh, let's look at Romans chapter 14, verse number 19. What does it mean to be edified? What does the scripture say about edification? It says here to instruct. Webster says, while well, you're turning there, Webster says to instruct and improve the mind in knowledge. That makes sense. Generally, and particularly in moral and religious knowledge, in faith and in holiness. That's why we come together to build you up in the faith and holiness. Is that always a pleasant task? Does that always feel good to you? I don't know. If you're struggling with some sin in your life and that preacher preaches against that and gives you Bible knowledge and shows you that your actions are wrong, your attitude is wrong, what you're doing is wrong, uh, it's not pleasing to God, what does that do? That edifies you. It teaches you and it equips you to live right. So what does that do? That edifies you. That builds you up. That strengthens you. That's what it does. Now, that's the, that's the definition. That's the meaning of it. Most people think, though, again, they think it means that, well, I come to church and it makes me feel good. Well, I mean, it ought to make you feel good when you come to church. There ought to be a part of that that makes you feel good. There ought to be the Holy Ghost ought to bear witness inside of you. Amen. Yeah, that does make me feel good. Though it, it, though it stomps on my flesh and my sin nature, I still don't, I, there's part of me that is still very edified by that when I leave there. I know that God has dealt with me. That's the way that God intended it to be. Amen. Romans chapter 14 and verse number 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. I I like this. He says in verse number 17 for the kingdom. He said, let not your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Wow, look at that. But righteousness? Hey, do you see the order of that, by the way? Brother Paul, you see the order of that right there? He says what first? Right, and then he says what? But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. He says it's not your meat and your drink. That's not what the kingdom of heaven's about. It's not about that. What's it about? Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness is first. So then what does he say in the next verse? What does he say there? He says, For, for he that in, in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. He's saying that you and I ought to live our lives in such a manner that it edifies one another. It edifies your brother. It edifies them. It builds them in the faith. Why? Because he says, he says that what we're, the kingdom of God is about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You know, I have to wonder when somebody walks around and they never have any joy. I have to wonder about, about What's wrong with them? As a child of God, what's wrong with you that you don't have any joy? Man, I'll tell you, life's not easy. There's a lot of challenges. There's a whole lot of challenges. But man, you ought to have the joy of the Holy Ghost. Amen? You ought to have that joy of the Holy Ghost. And it ought to be the edification of the saints. That ought to be what's happening there. When we come together, we ought to be edified. That ought to lift you up. To lift you up in, in, in the flesh is not what he's talking about. He's talking about lifting you up in the spirit and preaching to the new man and edifying you. Building you up in the most holy faith. That's what he's talking about. It's not my, Listen, let me, let me help you with something. 
It's not my job to make you feel good about your sin. (laughs) Do you understand that? It's not my job to hold your hand while you're living like the devil. It's not my job to to make you feel good when you treat everybody like, uh, walk around and act like a rattlesnake around everybody. And you want to bite and devour people. It's not my job to make you feel better through that. What what is my calling in life is to tell you the truth and to build you up in this most holy faith. That's what my calling is. That's what a preacher's job is to do, is to edify you. That's what we come together for as the saints, is to edify one another. That's why when we come to church, and and even when we're in private and we're, 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 we're spending time together in fellowship, we're always talking about this book. Amen. And about things that edify. Edification is not just making your flesh feel good. It's not making it feel good. That's not what edification is. Oh, I just I feel oh I just feel really good when I. Well, maybe that's not a good thing if you feel that good. If you're in a church and you always feel good when you go there, I mean, and you're you're never convicted. That's that's not a good thing. You you ought to be convicted. Hey, by the way, let me help you out with something, okay? Now. The Holy Ghost leads a preacher what to preach, okay? I believe that. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? And I don't mean that they're infallible. We make mistakes. I fully admit that. But that's, but that, but that's the Holy Spirit leads that way. But when you walk up to me or you say, make a comment to me and, and say like, well, you must have been preaching that for me. I mean, that don't make me feel bad. I, I get a chuckle out of it because it happens at least two or three times. And it's more than one person that thinks that the sermon was directed exactly at them and them alone. Good. I'm glad you feel that way. Keep feeling that way. Why? Because it tells me that God hit it right on the nose. That's why. Amen. That's what it tells me. It tells me that you were hit right between the eyes there with something and God is dealing with you. That's the way it's supposed to be. Amen. Amen. And if you get mad about it, that shows me even more <laughs> that it was probably the right thing you needed to hear. Amen. Amen. If you get mad about it, that tells me another thing. Think about it. Amen. Turn to 1 Corinthians, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Talking about edification here. What is edification? We need to understand this. I, th- I think we... We, we, we get these notions in our head of, of what things... Listen, just because things have been wrong for many years in, in fundamentalism, in churches, and everything else, doesn't mean we have to keep doing wrong. Amen? Doesn't mean we have to keep doing wrong. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 23. Actually, I'm going to back up to verse number 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you would you should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Well, that Paul, he's being so divisive here and so mean. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? It's a little scary, isn't it? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. What is he saying here? He's saying that, you know what? Sure, you can get away with a lot of things that the Bible doesn't exactly call sin. But that doesn't mean it edifies. That doesn't mean it teaches. That doesn't mean that it teaches knowledge, moral and religious knowledge and faith and holiness. That doesn't mean that it builds you up in your faith to do it or for someone else to see you do it. That doesn't mean that that helps them, does it? No, we're to edify one another. We're, our lives are to build up one another in the faith. That's what we're to, that's what as Christians, that's what, that's what we do. And primarily a lot of that work is done here in the assembly. It's done through the preaching and teaching of God's word. 
Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. That's a really good chapter for this. For edification. Remember, that's that religious knowledge, that, 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 that Bible faith, that, that holiness, understanding the Word of God, being edified in that and built up into that. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, there's, there's quite a few verses here about that. Actually, we'll start with verse number, actually, we'll start with verse number one. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that, that they prophesy, that they may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Okay, stop right there. What is he saying here? He's saying that, that you that prophesy or preach, they speaketh unto men to edification. Why? They're preaching. What did Paul say? Preach the word. Be instant in season, not a season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering of doctrine. He's saying, okay, great. You can speak in tongues, he was telling them. You can speak all these different languages or you can do this. And, and, uh, but he said, I would rather you prophesy. I would rather you preach in the assembly so every man can understand it and every man can listen and be edified by it. What is that doing? So every man can be built up by it in the in the in the faith. They can be strengthened in the faith. Let me ask you a question. When you leave church, do you learn something that day? Have you learned something? Think about it. When you leave after you hear the preaching of God's word, do you learn something? I hope so. I hope you have if you're listening, because the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So anything that is shared in this book that's that's preached according to what the Bible says, it's going to teach you something. It's going to edify you. Even if it's a lesson that you don't like. Especially if it's a lesson you don't like. Amen. It's to edify you. It's to build you up. What's he going to say here? He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. See what I mean? He said he that prophesieth, he that preacheth, when he's preaching, when he's prophesying, the whole church is edified. Why? That's the purpose. It's not to show off a bunch of gifts. It wasn't to do any of those things. What the purpose was, was to edify, was to build up in the most holy faith. That's what, that's what God wanted done. But some people think to build up means that I make you feel better about yourself. Well, listen, I'm not Joel Olstein. Okay, God didn't call me to make you feel better about yourself. Hey, Ben, on the contrary, when you're edified, you're going to feel worse about yourself. Why? Because you shouldn't feel that good about you anyway. Whoa, what do you mean? That's that's a mean thing to say. Yeah, it was said once before. Let me think. That is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So edification actually will make your flesh feel pretty bad sometimes. Most of the time. Why? Because God's word preached makes the sin nature, preached to the sin nature, makes it angry, makes it mad. Why? Because they're contrary. Duh. They're contrary. They don't like each other. Amen? The new man hates the old man, and the old man definitely hates the new man. You see, I always feel like there's a war going on. That's because there is. When you and I wake up in the morning, that starts the war for that day. What's it a war with, the old man? Why? Well, because the old man wants, wants you to live like the devil and get into sin. Wants you to look at pornography. Wants you to go run around on your wife. Wants you to go drink liquor and booze and, and alcohol or and, and, and view things that you shouldn't. Watch wicked television. Listen to rock music. And, and that's what the old man wants. I mean, it wants you to do it. In fact, there's things that come up that try. So what happens when you come to church? Well, you come to church, somebody takes the word of God and edifies you. Edifies the new man. 
You're not edifying the old man. It's reproving the wicked works of the old man. That's why it doesn't feel good. If you go to a church and you feel good every time you leave and everything feels just so wonderful and great and, 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 and you leave thinking better of yourself, oh man, you better run. You better run. That place is going to be a good haven for the Antichrist. <laughs> It already is. It already is a good place for the spirit of the Antichrist if you feel good all the time about what you hear. Amen? We got to get over this stuff, folks. We got that. We were under this impression that everything's just going to feel good and that's the way it's supposed to be. Why? Because preachers made you feel good about your sin your whole life? Well, they never said it was good to sin. No, they just don't preach against it, most of them. They won't stand up there and tell you how wicked Hollywood is because they're watching it themselves. I know because I was one of them. Amen. I know because I was one of them. So until you walk away from that, until you repent of that, walk away from it, have nothing to do with it, you won't preach against it. It's kind of hard to preach against yourself. Amen. Interesting, isn't it? Verse number five, I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you, that you prophesy, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. He's saying they need to understand what, what's going on. They need to be edified. They need to understand that the edification, that you're not growing them in the faith by speaking in, in tongues. <laughs> Nobody is being edified by that. And the modern day, the modern day uh, bewitching, witchcraft filled, charismatic movement. Yeah, it's a bunch of, it's a den of devils. Uh, that movement doesn't edify anybody. None of that edifies. Doesn't edify at all. They know it too. They know it full well. Verse number 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Why? Because Paul says, you know, if you speak in an unknown tongue and, and, and well, hold on, let's, let's back up here a little. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh the barbarian. And he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so, ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Look at that. Of the church. Where does edification take place at? At the church. Is it any wonder that most churches today are so full of music programs? Now, I'm not against playing music. I'm not against people playing instruments. So I'm not against that. What I'm saying is, is that it's all they do now. Most of their, most of their, it's, it's like a production. When they do special music, it's like a grand entrance to some, I mean, it's just, I mean, they even get the whole opera facial thing going. You ever seen that? Oh man, that's, I think Bob Jones University teaches that. I think they teach that kind of opera style with their face and they, they just look off into a point and they look like, you know, I'm sorry, I'd say. but it, that, that's what they do. I, I know, I know, you know, you're crazy. No, I'm not crazy. That's what they do. They do it. They teach them to do those kind of things. What does that have to do with it? What does that have to do with anything? I'm not saying a song can't edify or something like that. I, I understand it can, but it, we, we, most churches, they have moved on from, keep, their sermons have to be 28 minutes long, but everything else can be 45 minutes long. If anything, the sermon has to suffer, but not the music program and the talent show that goes on. The American Idol in the church house. Ooh, um, That's my next sermon. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but that, can't be, that, that can't be held off. It's got to be, that can't be cut short. Everything else has to be. It's, it's where we're, that's where we're at today. It's sad, but that's, that's exactly where it is. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, that all things be done unto edifying. It's supposed to edify. 
supposed to build up in the faith. Now, let me ask you, I, I want to back up. Now, I'm not trying to promote myself. I'm not trying to make myself a better, so I'll use Brother Russ, I'll use myself, other men that have preached. Does it edify you if someone preaches on drunkenness? Does that edify you? Does that build you up in your most holy faith? Does that teach you? Does that? Okay. Well, that's edifying. That's edifying, isn't it? If I teach you the biblical aspects of wine, what they are in the Bible, what the word wine was used, and now you have that holy knowledge, does that edify you? Does that teach you and build you up in the faith? If you, if, if brother, if, if brother Paul comes up here when he preached on the King James Bible and he, and he, and he taught some lessons on, taught a lesson on the King James Bible, which he's not done yet, by the way. He's got a lot more to teach. But, um, uh, a lot more. But, uh, um, when he, when he teaches on the King James, does that edify you? Does that strengthen your faith? Does that make you stronger? When, when you're preached against rebellion and, and, and you, you're preached on rebellion, when Brother Russ preaches on geocentricity, does that edify you that you can look at the Scripture and say, well, Joshua, he said the sun stood still. I mean, that's all you have to understand about that. It seems pretty easy to me that what he's saying is as a geocentric world. That's what he was saying. The sun stood still. It means the sun moves most of the time. But that's not what scientists say. I don't care. Scientists say Jesus isn't real. I mean, okay, scientists don't believe in the resurrection. Scientists curse God. I don't care what science says. I care what this says. If you had a dream and a pink buffalo came to you tonight and told you the Bible wasn't true, I wouldn't care either. Amen? I wouldn't. If you see the pink buffalo, you should be scared. Though. That's right. Amen? But that's edifying. How about if you're, how, how about if repentance is preached to you and confession of sin and getting your heart right with God and, 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 uh, and against Hollywood and against wicked movies and rock and roll music and all those other things. Is that edifying? How about some, how, how about you're called down for your, uh, through the preaching of God's word for rebellion and, and, and wickedness and, 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 and have a rebellious heart towards God? Is that, is that, is that edification? If you read the strictest sense of the scripture, then yes, it is, because it's teaching you something about 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 your faith. It's teaching you how to build up your faith. It's building your faith. That's what it's doing. The Bible says anyway. Second Corinthians, chapter 12, verse number 19. Again, thank you that we excuse ourselves unto you. We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, dear the beloved, for your edifying. Listen to me. If I thought for one second, if I preached one message to you that I did not believe would teach you something or build up your faith, I wouldn't preach it. I, just, I, I wouldn't do it. The purpose of doing it is to build your faith. Amen. That's the reason of doing it, to make you a stronger Christian, to help you to abstain from all appearance of evil, to stay away from the things that you need to stay away from, and to build you stronger in the faith. That's the purpose. But it's funny when somebody says, well, I don't need that. Do you realize what you're saying? If you say that you didn't, a message was preached, whether it's whatever it's on, doesn't matter what it is. Oh, I didn't need that. Boy, that's a scary place to be. Really? I don't need that? First of all, let me help you with something. That shows an extreme amount of immaturity. And yes, you do need it, you little brat. You need it more than anybody. Amen! You need it more than anybody. You may not like that, but that's fine. You don't have to like it. I said it. And it's true. You're acting like a little bratty kid that tells his mom and dad, I don't need that. My kids do it all the time. Oh, no, I, can, I don't need to do that. No, you do need it. <laughs> no, but I don't need that. Yes, you do. You don't understand how that's like a little kid? I don't need that kind of preaching. I don't need to. Oh, yes, you do. If you didn't, God wouldn't ordained it to be here. Amen. It just sounds like a bunch of Israelites complaining in the wilderness. Amen. That's what it is. A bunch of Israelites complaining in the wilderness, telling God what they need. And when God wanted to give them the victory, they wouldn't take it. It says right there. 
I can't help but think the first time when they left, the first time when they murmured and complained against God, when he was trying to teach them lessons and he was trying to help them, and they murmured and complained against him, that rebellion that they had right there was the reason they couldn't go take that mountain with any confidence when it was time to go take that land of Canaan. And they wouldn't obey God. Why? Because back here, they believed him not. They would not receive the, 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 the message that he had for them. They ignored it. So then when it was time to go take that mountain, they couldn't do it. You know what? When you ignore Bible preaching and you think you don't think you need it, you don't think it applies to you, you don't think any of that, listen, let me tell you something. You say, did you preach that message for me? Yes. If any of you ask me that, yes, I did. Yes, I did. Absolutely. Amen. I preached it for me, too. Because I'm in this body, too. Remember? It's a body. Yes, we all need it. That's not hard to understand, is it? That's real simple. By the way, did you expect a preacher to stand up and not preach something you needed? I'm just curious. Because the way I've always seen it work from Genesis to Revelation was that that preacher was to stand up there and preach what the people needed to hear. (laughs) And guess what it never was? What they wanted to hear. It was never that. It was never that. It was always what they want, what they needed, not what they wanted. <laughs> they never wanted it. But when the Israelites, when they, when they, when they murmured and complained against Moses and God, and they came down from the mountain, God said, "Oh, oh, you're in trouble now." And He slammed those stones down. Did He give them the message they wanted to hear? No, He gave them the one they needed to hear. It amazes me that somebody would come to church and actually believe that they shouldn't be edified. Because that's really what you're saying, if you believe that. You're saying, I want to come to church, but I don't want to be edified. I want you to make me feel good. Well, then go hear Joel Olstein. He'll make you feel great about yourself. He'll also pave the way for a good, uh, for the, on the road to hell for you, too. He's a good snake oil salesman. And by the way, there's a lot of Baptists around here that are just about the same. They'll make you feel good, too. Because they'll never get personal with any sin. Never. So you'll feel good about your sin. And then you'll actually like them. I, I'm just curious. Do you, do you think the Israelites liked Moses? Did they? Did they like him? No. They loved him. They mourned him when he died. But they didn't always like him. What did they do to him? Well, don't you remember what they did to him? Every chance they got, well, let's stone him. Let's kill him. Let's kill him and set up a prince over us. We don't need that. We don't need that preaching. We don't need that Moses. Who do you think you are anyway, Moses? Well, Moses is the one that's supposed to edify you. That's who he is. Moses is the one that God's called to do that. Now, we edify one another, and we'll, we'll get to that here. We'll keep going here. Am I making sense to you here? I hope this is making sense. I'm trying to edify you. Amen? You get like two for one here. All for the price of one. That's a great deal. 50%? (laughs) Buy one, get one free. (laughs) Bogo, yeah. Oh, that's terrible. Anyway. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 8, For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord has given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. What's he saying there in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 8? He, said, I, he goes, I have authority. He's saying, I, I have authority, Right? For though I should boast somewhat more, as I could, I should maybe boast some more here of my authority, which the Lord have given us. But what's it for? Edification. Do you get that? The pastor's authority in the assembly is for what? For edification. Not for him to be. What does it say? Look at it again, what it says there. It says, not for your destruction. But it's for your edification. 
I, I'm not, I'm not here to destroy you. I'm here to, I, I'm here to edify you. I'm here to help you. That's what I'm here for. But not the help that you want, the help that God wants you to have. That's what it's for. Okay, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 10, Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness. Ooh, remember Paul? Remember the sharpness he had to use? Remember when he wrote that first letter? This is 2 Corinthians chapter 13, I'm sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 10. <laughs> remember, remember Paul's first letter? Ooh, man. Remember, remember how sharp he was with him? Ooh, man. He was like, hey, and if I have to show up, I will. Ooh, a little scary, wasn't it? But he says, therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not destruction. Again, he says it again in 13. In, in second, he says, my power is not to destroy you. Listen, this preaching will not destroy you. Now it will destroy your the, the sin. It will destroy the sin nature. This 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 biblical straightforward preaching will not make your flesh feel good. You'll it, it, you won't feel good about your sin under this type of preaching. You're not supposed to. You're not supposed to. You're not supposed to feel good about it, right? So he says, I, but it's not for your destruction, but it's for your edification. It's to build you up. That preaching is to build you up. Well, I don't feel, no, if you're trying to walk in the flesh, you won't feel built up. <laughs> you're right, you won't. If you're trying to live in the flesh, then you, you'll feel beat up. Does that make sense? Did you hear that? Let me help you again with that one more time. If you are living in the flesh, then Bible preaching will make you feel beat up, not built up. Because you want to live in the flesh and you're rebellious to God. So you're going to feel like you were in a boxing match every time you go to church. <laughs> Amen. That's, that's, the way, that's the way it's supposed to be. Not supposed to make you feel comfortable in your sin. Now, turn to Ephesians chapter 4, please. Now, where this takes place here is the assembly, like we've talked about. But this, this really nails it down here. In verse number, we'll back up uh, to verse number 10. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. To pastors and teachers. Now, by the way, not all teachers are pastors, but all pastors must be teachers. Does that make sense? There, there's teachers in this assembly right now that teach the word of God. Uh, Brother Paul, Brother Lee, Brother, Brother Andrew, other men, Brother Russ. Brother Russ, some are preachers and teachers, but not all are pastors. Amen? Not all, but all teach, but all may not be pastors. There's a difference. There's a difference in that. But he says here, and he gave some, their gifts. God gave them. They are the gifts of the saints. He gave, he gave the pastors to the churches. He gave teachers. He gave apostles, which by the way means sent one. A lot of people call them church planners too as well, but that's another, that's a, that's a whole other, another, another, uh, uh, topic of discussion actually, but we'll, we'll talk about that sometime. Anyway, um, not that we're going to reinstate the term apostles, <laughs> call each other apostles, I'm not saying that, but it does mean sent one. That's the meaning of it. If you study it out, that's what it means. It means that they were sent one. So, anyway, uh, but, uh, but it says here, and he gave them what? And some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. For the perfecting of the saints. Wait a minute. What does that mean? 
So they'll be perfect? No. Not in the sense that we use the word perfect. But when something comes to perfection, that means it's ready. Do you get what I mean? Not perfect without blemish. Not, 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 not in the sense of perfect as in flawless, but perfect as in mature. Does that make sense? Perfect as like an apple is ripe and it's perfect, right? It may have some kind of a blemish on it, but it's, it's ripe and it's ready. It's perfect. It's come to perfection in that, in that way. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Because he, he explains that. That's exactly true. For the perfecting of the saints, the ongoing work of perfecting the saints. And guess what? That work is not pleasant. And you aren't always going to like it. Just like you didn't always like when your mom and daddy had to deal with you or correct you or, or instruct you in righteousness or teach you because you fought it sometimes. You got mad at it sometimes. You didn't like it sometimes. Still don't like it, do you? I don't either like it all the time. But I know I need it. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Look at this. For the edifying of the body of Christ. That's what God gave the pastor for. So then let me ask you a question. When the, when, when the, when the preacher preaches on something and it's, it steps on your toes or it makes you upset and he preaches against your sin and he preaches against wickedness or wrong living or something that's not right, why would you get mad that he's doing what God told him to do and put him there to do? Why would you, why would you get mad at him for it? Instead of getting mad at your own flesh for sinning against God, what do they do? Just like Israel did. They stone the prophets. <laughs> they stone them. They, they, they get mad at them. They get mad. Why? Well, what we're trying to do is perfect you. To edify, and we do that by edification. That's the whole purpose of coming together. Is that, that's why the church is so important. That's why the church is more important than just your little selfishness. It's more important than your little, oh, I think everything should be this way. That's wonderful. I'm glad, but guess what? This is about more than just you. It's about all of us together glorifying God. That's what it's about. It's not about just you. Oh, I don't like something the pastor does. Grow up. I don't like something the pastor does too, okay? And I'm the pastor. I don't like myself either sometimes. Right? I don't like some things I say either. But we have to determine whether we want to be edified or not. I don't like the way you say it. That's okay. They don't like the way Elijah said it either. Or John the Baptist, or Jesus, or Peter, or Paul, or Mary. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> sorry, couldn't resist it. But the, it just it just kept coming. I don't. It just it just did. But anyway, anyway, they they, they didn't like it. Yeah, strike that from the record. Uh, they they didn't they didn't like that, did they? No, they didn't like the way. Oh, I no, they just they just didn't. John, they or I mean, uh, John the Baptist, they just didn't like the way he was dressed. No, they didn't like what he said. And then when Jesus looked at all the religious ones with their nice phylacteries and their nice robes and everything else, he looked at him and says, "You hypocrites!" They didn't like that, you know. But I could understand why you would think God in the flesh was wrong for saying that. And I can see why you would think that if I followed his pattern, that I would be wrong for following God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. I could see why you would have a problem with that if you were living wickedly or if your heart wasn't right with God. I could see why you'd be upset about that. I could see why you'd be upset at the, like the king when he was so upset when, when the prophets went out and cried out to them. And remember, uh, his father, the prophet, his father actually saved that king's life. And then he went out and his son went out and killed that prophet's son. 
put him to death. Actually stuck him on a saw and cut him. Sawn asunder, it's called. When they killed the prophets, why? They didn't like what they were saying. Oh no, they just didn't like their personality. That's what it was, wasn't it, Brother Paul? They just didn't like, I know what it was. It was, it was Isaiah's personality that got him chopped up. That's what it was, Isaiah. They just don't like your personality. You just need a better personality and people would like what you're saying a whole lot more. No, I don't think it was a personality. John the Baptist. Uh, they just didn't like his clothes. That's what it was. No. He looked at that old wicked king and said, well, you can't have that woman to be your wife. You're a fornicator. Off went his head. Was it his personality they didn't like or was it the message? I think it was the message they didn't like. Was he not edifying? How about the Apostle Paul? When he preached the Corinthians, they got a little upset, I'm sure. He preached a little hot and heavy with those Corinthians, didn't he? Folks, you're not always going to like the message, but that doesn't mean it's not profitable to you. That doesn't mean that it's not edifying. We, we think edification, again, is just to make us feel good. No, it's not. It's to build you up in the faith. That means if I can take what I learned tonight about edification and it builds my faith, then that means that I grew. Now, maybe I didn't like everything that was said or how it was said or any of those things, but you know what? I still learned something. It still built my faith up to understand what edification is. That's true, too. I mean, there's two. Well, I mean, you know, I, I've had that. Well, who needs to hear that sermon? Well, first of all, maybe it's none of your business who needs to hear it. Maybe you should just sit there and listen and see if you need to hear it. I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you what. You know, one of the scariest places I've ever seen somebody be is to think they don't have a problem with anything. That they're going to be fine. Oh, I'm good. I'll be okay. See, I don't think that. I don't walk around my life thinking that I couldn't slip and fall into something. I don't live my life like that. I don't live my life like that. I've been saved and away from drugs and liquor and all that stuff for 13, 14 years. But I'm going to tell you something right now. I sure don't think that it's beyond me, beyond my flesh. I don't think pornography and I don't think I don't think adultery and fornication is beyond my flesh if I just live in it. I don't think drunkenness is beyond my flesh if I just make the wrong decisions. I don't think so. So when some preacher stands up and he preaches the word of God and he edifies me and he preaches against something, I file that away. I file that away. And guess what it does? It strengthens me. For when the devil comes with the temptation, that's the way out. Because that lesson comes up in my mind and God says, wait, remember this? Remember when this was preached to you? Remember when you were supposed to do this? Boy, I don't want to catch, I don't want to be in that place in my life to think that I'm above any sin. That's a scary place to be, friend. You better take any lesson that somebody gives from this book like that and take it to heart. Take heed lest you fall. That's what the Bible says. Take heed lest you fall. I had a pastor once tell me that, oh, I can counsel with women by myself because I don't have a problem with that. I don't have, I've never had a problem with women. I don't know what that meant, but <laughs> I'm guessing he said he meant that he didn't have it. You know, he's never had any improper act, act in his in his marriage or anything like that. And that 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 don't mean anything, though. I don't mean anything at all. Devil tempt you just like you will anybody else. Hey, Amen. Devil tempt you just like he will anybody else. By preaching edifies, it lifts up. But it lifts up the new man. It makes the old man feel bad. Right? 
By the way, your flesh isn't supposed to feel good. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Look at that again. Knowledge of the Son of God. Unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What? We preach and we teach this Bible so we can all come together in the unity of the faith. Perfecting one another. To the perfect man, to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be, be no more children tossed to and fro. Oh, I don't want to hear doctrine. I don't want to hear doctrine. Why do you think so many people are, are tossed to and fro today? Because doctrine isn't preached. Oh, doctrine's dry. I heard one pastor tell me one time, or one member of a church tell me one time, their pastor said, well, we teach this in Bible Institute. I said, oh, that's good. You know, it's good they teach at Bible Institute, but he said, they, I won't teach it to the church. So I said, well, why wouldn't you teach it to the church? Oh, they couldn't bear it. They couldn't handle it. Um, they, they don't have a Bible school in, in the Bible. There was just the assembly of the saints, and they preached. <laughs> so, I mean, I'll tell you one thing right now. Now, I'm not against people having a Bible Institute or a church having a Bible Institute. They do it themselves. I'm not against that. But I'm going to tell you something right now. You sit here for three or four years, and you will be prepared to go out there and pastor if God's called you. How? Preaching the word, building up in your most holy faith, preaching out on the streets, studying the Bible yourself, and being edified with the word of God. It's just people don't know what edification really is. It's building up your faith. It's building you up in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Under that perfect man. That's what it's about. The body. It's not about you. It's not about you singly. Just you. Everything is about more than just you. You know, there are people that I see that everything's about them. Everything. Every sermon's about them. Every problem's about them. Everything in their life is centered around them. If you're that selfish of a person, <laughs> yeah, you won't like being in a church because this is about us glorifying him. That's, it's about us coming together, being edified. Why? So we glorify God that he might receive glory in the church throughout all ages. That's why. That's why. That we, hence be, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. See that? Making increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. You know, it takes love to tell people the truth when they don't want to hear it. That's love. It's love to tell them the truth when they don't want to receive it. And even though you know some of them are going to hate you for it. When we go out and preach the gospel, it's the love of God. We go out and preach the gospel to people. Why? Well, because we first love Him because He loved us. He loved us first. We love Him. We go obey his commandments and we go preach. Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace out of the hearers. Again, to the use of edifying. How is it building your faith? So what you have to do is decide, well, am I being edified? When I hear preaching, when I come to the assembly, am I being edified? The question you have to ask yourself is not this. Do I like what I hear all the time? Do I like the personality of the preacher? <laughs> do I like the way he says everything? Do I like, do I not like this? And I don't, no, that's not the question you ask yourself. Am I being edified? Has it strengthened my faith? Is what was said the truth and does it add to my arsenal of faith?
And guess what? If the preacher's preaching the Bible, there isn't anything that he can do that doesn't. That's why God made it so simple. Wherefore, First, first Thessalonians 5.11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Again, that's the saints coming together to edify, building up the faith. How do we build up the faith? Well, there's many ways to do that. We expose sin. We expose the wrong. We show how the right way. What does it say? Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering of doctrine. For the, for the word of God is what? For instruction and in righteousness? For correction, for instruction and in righteousness? You give correction. You give instruction for righteousness. So you correct the error, but you also instruct the right way. That's what biblical preaching does. That's what preaching the Word does. And in closing, he says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 4, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions. Rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. He's saying godly edifying in faith. That's what we're to do. You're not always going to like the message that's preached. You might not always like the delivery. You might not, but is it edifying? Is it building up in the most holy faith? Is it strengthening your faith to learn something from the Word of God? And the answer is yes, if you believe the Bible. That's the answer. If you believe what the Word of God is saying, then yes. If the Bible's being preached, then yes, it's building your faith. Amen. Father, thank you so much for your Word. I just pray you bless us now. I pray, Lord, it was clear. I pray it was understanding. Help us to grow thereby from it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.